Yeah. All right, let's dive into the matchup. Things we are watching for in OUSMU. Ted, let's start on the defensive side of the ball for the Sooners. What are you watching for? What what are you looking for for OU's defense and SMU's offense? Here's what's interesting. You know, I just talking about how good SMU's offense is going to be. We saw last year that, you know, we were a, a four-man front for the first couple of games, and then whenever we went to Nebraska, we busted out an entirely new defense that we hadn't seen, I don't think, maybe a handful of snaps leading up to that, but I honestly don't remember seeing any. And then we come out in a three-man front and some exotic stuff on the back end, a lot of blitzes, and really got after Nebraska. And I'm curious to see how that goes this year. A lot of four-man front in, in game one, almost all of it, except for one snap. And on that one snap, we had Justin Harrington and uh, McCullough out there together in, in a dime package, which I know SMU saw that. It was like, what in the hell are they going to do out of this thing? All right. Cause you got some, you got some bodies out there that you typically don't see. So I'm curious to see how that part of it goes, but as far as SMU, I, I think the strength of their offense, they've got good skill guys. So I'm not, I, I'm not saying anything bad about the skill guys. I think there's some really good talent there running back deep wide receiver, pretty deep. But I think the offensive line is kind of where this thing starts. It seems like a, a smart group, communicate well. Um, I think the interior is what really stands out, and I'd like to get your opinion on that. Um, the tackles, I think, are solid, better in pass pro than they are. They're kind of stiff, big guys that don't, don't seem to move great. But um, I think that that offensive line is going to be really the biggest test. Coming into the game, I was – I was really worried about, you know, the wide receivers against our secondary and, you know, cause there was some stuff, there were some opportunities for Arkansas state to push the ball down the field on us and they couldn't do it. Um, you know, but we blitzed almost every single snap in that game. So there's, there's a lot of green grass out there. Our, our secondary was covering, but I, I feel better about the skill position matchup today than I did a couple of days ago but I'm a little bit more concerned about the matchup on the line of scrimmage. If this is going to be a legitimately good test for our D line. I, I completely agree. Now, when I watched their game against Louisiana tech, I, and maybe you disagree, but I, none of the skill guys really jumped off the tape to me and made me go, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, now and I was surprised by that. Honestly, I, I was as well. Right. I expected to see like burners at wide receiver. Now, you look at the size, the weight, and they're extremely productive in that football game. Right. These guys aren't slappies. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, if, if you are not dialed in, if you're Oklahoma secondary, they will undoubtedly run by you. Right. But neither of the backs jumped off the tape to me. But I think you're right, man. I, I think the group that really stood out to me where I was like, man, they are rock solid is the offensive line, especially the interior of the offensive line. I love their center. I do too. I texted you about him. I was like, this dude, he's got all the old vet moves. He's He's got a bag of tricks now. He's always in the right place, smart. They work well together, man. Yeah, and he's he's played a lot of football for him, right? So the bottom line for me, when you look at what SMU wants to do offensively, OU's defensive line is going to have to get off blocks. There, there's only so much you, you can do with how they're going to spread you out defensively, right? You can only commit so much to the box. And it's going to be guys winning their one-on-ones. Like the guy that is going to have to eat the double team, right? You got to hold up, right? You can't get moved off the football. It's the other guys that are going to have one-on-ones, and I'm talking run game, not, not pass rush, run game. You have to win those. We talk about winning one-on-ones as a defensive lineman, and people always think it's pass rush. No, no, no. When your buddy is getting zone double teamed and you got the tackle one-on-one, you got to win. Yep. You got to win. So that's where I, 
I don't think it's overly complicated, man. They got to they got to play with great technique along the line of scrimmage, get off some blocks and make some plays along this D, along the D line. I, I think yeah. that's the key to the game. I I do too. I I totally agree. Um, you know, just some of uh, some of the things that you know from from the game against Louisiana Tech now you and I talked and we we both agree really vanilla really vanilla from SMU so i i know we're going to get some more stuff from them but you know i this is bread and butter stuff you still typically are going to see a lot of bread and butter stuff personnel groupings interesting personnel groupings um you're going to get 11 uh you know one back one tight end three wide receivers They'll do that. They'll run 10 personnel with no tight end in there and four wide receivers and, and a back. But what's interesting is you're going to get true base, true 21 out of SMU. They've got a fullback, 44, old school, uh, neck roll, wearing a 44 fullback number. He's going to be yeah. in there. Uh, they'll run 20 personnel with uh, a running back, a fullback, no tight end in the game, and three wide receivers. So some interesting – like it's it's weird to say that those are weird personnel groupings that you but you don't see a whole lot of true base anymore um so i I thought that was interesting they'll run some outside zone um they'll run that out of out of the 21 personnel with the full back in they like to run it away from him he'll start as a wing they'll run outside zone away they'll even go tackle over and the fullback will be on the line as what would appear to be the tackle, but it's unbalanced. And they'll run outside zone to the to the unbalanced side, which is interesting. Um, they'll run split zone. They'll run split zone where the fullback goes to the tight end side, which is a stupid ass play. It always has been, uh, <laughs> but they'll run that uh, in the in the passing. Oh, little bit of um, power O too, uh, yeah. traditional power O. And that was one of their more explosive plays early in the game is a uh, really good double, horrible fit by Louisiana Tech. Backer takes the run through, and the safety's got to come all the way across. But that one gets out the gate, and they blocked it up good. Um, the guard pulling around wasn't great, but, you know, pretty solid, and they got good push there. So that was interesting to see. Uh, in the passing game, not a whole lot of variety, honestly. You'll get a lot of the bubble stuff. And I was shocked. I didn't think the tight end Maryland, I don't think he's a very good blocker. I don't think he's very good in the, in the box and out on the perimeter. I don't know if he's stiff or maybe is a little unsure, but I, I didn't, I didn't come away just wild, but with what they looked like on the perimeter blocking up defensive backs. Yeah. The Maryland 82, I think he's out there to catch passes. Yeah. Right. He is, he's a good looking athlete, right? There, there's no doubt. Still a young player, but what did you, you know, there, there's a nice variety in the run game. What, what do you think of the QB? What do you think of stone? I think he's okay. He's, he's pretty athletic. I think he, he seems to be smart with the football. He, he was willing to push it down the field whenever, even whenever he had tight coverage, try and let his guys, go make a play. There was a couple scrambles where he looked, you know, he looked good moving around, but I I don't think it's anyone that you, you start to screw with your run fits to worry about him keeping the ball on you. Um, You know, I I think he's, it's like, we'll play it true and then we'll rally to the quarterback. It's not, let's try and reinvent what we do because we're so worried about him carrying the football. I don't think that's the case. Um, I, okay pocket presence and I think a lot of that stems from him really trusting that offensive line which is you know key for him to really he stays in there keeps his eyes downfield uh and that, that comes from trusting that offensive line I I wasn't blown away but you know didn't see a whole lot of like I said variety in the passing game they ran like 95 t- the you know number three coming across and trying to hit a dig on the back side of that um you know they they Takeoffs, fades, they'll throw those quite a bit. They try and work some digs in the middle of the field, clear guys out and run digs in. A handful of boot plays, but, you know, nothing, nothing it, it wasn't like super impressive on the boot. You know, I did see him run the, 
you know, the illegal wide receiver drag screen where he comes and he comes back on the other side of the, the line of scrimmage. Everyone has that play in. They do too. Um, I just, I, I think they're a good offense and I still believe they're going to be one of the better offenses that we face. But the more I've watched it, the better I think our defense is going to perform. I, it kind of scares me that we both are on the same page with that. I don't like that. I agree, but can't be scared, right? Can't be scared. Uh, There's nothing wrong with having confidence. I, I do think, like just when you think about what the box score is going to look like at the end of the game, right? I do think that if you have, like if Stone is thrown, had to throw the ball like 45 times, I think you're going to see a comfortable win for Oklahoma. Yeah, I agree. I I don't think that's going to be the recipe for them to come into Norman and to give the Sooners the game. If If they can lean on the run game and that offensive line, right? Now they want to play with tempo. But that that's what that offense does. But I, I do wonder if Lashley looks at it and goes, okay, if we can run it, maybe we need to think about when we want to go fast and when we want to dial it back. Right. But if you force if you force them to be a one dimensional offense, with what I've seen from Preston Stone, he's not the type of guy that's just gonna pick you apart. In fact, he's you go back and look at that Louisiana Tech game. He just kind of throws a couple up, right? Like, hey guys, go make plays. I agree. And so I, there's gonna be there's gonna be some opportunities for Oklahoma secondary to go and get the football. But yeah, I think if you if you can limit that run game, then you're feeling really good about where you're gonna be defensively. Yeah. And you know, uh, I like the offensive line, but Louisiana Tech was not very talented and from what I saw, the majority of the time they were in the, ex- the same exact front, just running like an over front. And OU's going to throw over. They're going to throw bear at you. They're going to be in, you know, straight up three man odd stuff. They're going to be blitzing from all kinds of different angles and, and bringing corners off the, you know, from the boundary. There's, they're going to throw a lot more mentally at those guys. And physically, they're, they're dealing with a different level of football player. Right. I don't, I, the tackles are, they're huge, right? They're both like six, eight, six, nine, over 320 pounds. I, I will be very surprised if OU can't get home on stone against those tackles right now. You got to force them into those drop back passing situations. Right. But I, I'm thinking guys like trace Ford, you know, our Mason Thomas is supposed to be back out there. Guys that have great get-offs, that twitch, these are big. The The best word I could come up with is lumbering tackles. They're not bad. They're not bad football players. They're just not athletic guys, right? They don't move particularly well. So those guys for Oklahoma off the edge that have a little more twitch, I think they can get home as pass rushers. Or I'll, I'll be really surprised and honestly a little disappointed if they can't. Yeah. Well, and. You know, I, we, we got to take advantage of matchups whenever we get them. I did see your favorite protection. They went full slide and brought what the tight end all the way back across the fo- uh, formation to block the end guy, which happened to be, I think, a, a blitzer on that one. But, you know, if we get opportunities against tight ends, against fullbacks, who I think we're going to, we got to win those battles. I, like the full, the fullback. I mean, he's a thumper. He's a straight, straight line guy. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that he's, I mean, he's a willing blocker, but he's not a guy that you're worried about physically. And he's pretty stiff whenever he's in pass pro. So like, we got to win those matchups. Should we just, if you are, if you're an edge guy for OU and you get singled, like if you get pass blocked one-on-one by a tight end or a fullback, I feel like there just needs to be a section of the podcast where we make fun of you quickly. Yeah. That we, seems fair. Like if you were an edge guy for Oklahoma, you should not be getting pass road by a tight end or a fullback. No, every now and then there's a tight end comes around and I, we're not going to see any, but every now and then a tight end comes around. And it's like, okay, that guy doesn't technically count. Yeah. As like Rob end. Gronkowski. Okay. Gronkowski fair enough. Or, uh, 
uh, Mercedes Lewis, like yeah. he could pass pro. Yeah, so- we'll we'll acknowledge the exceptions, but I feel like that's a pretty good blanket rule we can just apply. We need a dunce hat or something that we put on whenever we're talking about it. Yeah. Oh, uh, anything else? OU's defense, SMU's offense. I. Uh, that's it, and I'm. I'm pretty optimistic about the way I think our defense should play against these guys. I mean, we're. I. It's going to be a nice test on the offensive line. They're far better than what we saw in Arkansas State, but I still think that we should have an uh, an edge everywhere else everywhere else and if we're going to be the team that we want to be we should end up having an edge on the line of scrimmage even against uh this good offensive line i'm with you all right let's talk about things to watch for for ou's offense against smu's defense they're coached by a former sooner so i'm not surprised interior defense line is well coached man Mm -hmm. they play with good pad level good hand placement if ou's offensive line wants to get movement they have to play with low pads and good technique. I think their starting defensive tackles are rock solid. Now, Elijah Chapman, 40, he is a little ball of muscle, man. He is not a tall guy. I don't think he's an overly athletic guy, but I know this. He was on Bruce Feldman's freak list. That dude is strong as all hell. 225, 47 reps, Ted. Wow. So you're not going to win in a strength off with this guy. So what do you have to do, man? You got to play with great power level. You got to get underneath him, even though he's a shorter dude. But if you allow this guy to play underneath your pads, you are going backwards because he is strong as all hell. Okay. That's just it. And then the guy I like the most is six Jordan Miller, right? Miami transfer big moves. Well, really takes on double teams well like you know almost a little drop knee technique where the knee is half an inch off the ground and he's straining straining and not getting moved I really liked what I saw from him in their opener but I, I think this is the key right that there is a significant drop off from what I see from that first group of defensive linemen they have and their second group so I wouldn't be surprised when they have to sub I could see Levy saying, okay, let's keep those guys out there. Let's keep that second line out there. Let's go fast and not let them sub. So that's mm-hmm. something I'm keeping an eye on. But some of the stuff Savion Bird got away with last week, he's not going to get away with against this starting group for, for SMU. He's just not. So the technique, the physicality, like it's got to be, it's got to be taken to another level. Cause I'm telling you, man, this first group, this starting group for SMU along the defensive front, these guys can play. They can play. Did they throw any exotic fronts or anything out there? <laughs> so, uh, no. It was about as vanilla as you can see. But, Ted, you know I went and watched like four games from a year ago. Come on. Mm-hmm. You're, you're going to see some different fronts, and you're going to have to apply it to the offensive line's communication in the run game and the pass game. Right. And the old line and the running backs are going to have to communicate in the past game. Like, Hey, where are you guys working? Who do I have? And you're, you're, I think they're going to get a lot of different looks. Now, last week against La Tech, you're talking your traditional four, two, five clean picture type of situation. But going back last year, you know, I watched Tulane. I watched Memphis, even watched they played TCU last year, watched that game as well. You're going to get an overload front right? Meaning three defensive linemen on one side of the ball with the defensive end on the opposite edge. You got to communicate, right? It may look weird, but that's four down. That's four down in pass protection. Yeah. You got to communicate that to the back in pass pro. Now they will jump into it. You'll love this. It's kind of like an old school under front, right? We're talking shade five, nine backside three, but there's no backside five they play their nickel off the ball, like as an apex player. And he's got the responsibilities, like the old school responsibilities, the five technique would have. It's interesting. Oh, well, I'd make him earn it. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's one of my things to watch, but yeah. you're, you're going to see, I'm sure they've got, they've got some three man stuff in the repertoire. Like everyone does at this point, but 
what they showed quite a few times last year is you got four down, but you got five up. You got a backer mugged up, whether it's over a guard, over a center. How are you going to treat that guy in pass protection, right? Does he become a down guy? Are they baiting you, right, to try to get a matchup on the back? They'll even go six up, right? Are you going to slide protect that stuff? Are you going to – is does the quarterback know, hey, if this guy comes, I got to get the ball out of my hands? Like, there's going to be communication that is absolutely crucial. No secrets out there, gentlemen. Communicate yeah. it and let's roll. So, yeah, no, you're going to – you're going to need to see – you're you're going to see a lot a lot more than what you saw a week ago from a front and movement standpoint. They did a lot of stuff last year where they'll stem right before the snap. Right, it, it kind of reminded me of some of the stuff Grinch would do. Right, right before you're about to snap it, they're going to stem. You got to be disciplined. You got to hold your water. Can't flinch. Like that stuff. They're they are going to unload the clip defensively, if I had to guess. But yeah, man, they got. They got a little bit of everything that I'm anticipating them doing on Saturday. Yeah. I expect the like the tempo to probably go um super fast to start drives. And if they can get a first down, they'll keep pushing, but they get five or six plays in. I expect them to change personnel, let the defense uh match get the big guys out and then they're going to hit the brakes and they're going to go slow. They're not going to change personnel. They're going to stay in the same grouping and probably grind on that second team defensive line. Um, yeah. You know, try and try and really manipulate the personnel out there on the field and where the, where the good guys out with lateral stuff. And when they get out, here we come right at you with, uh, against the backups. I love that plan. Now, couple other things i'm looking at they play with corner type bodies at their nickel spot right both guys about 185 pounds and you know number one brandon crossley number 22 kale sanders those are the guys that i saw in the louisiana tech game so how do we get those guys in the run fit right how do we formate things whether it's 12 personnel you know, how are they going to line up to that? Are they going to bring the nickel into the fit, or does that bring a safety into the fit? You probably like your chances either way. Now, last week, we saw OU do some tackle over, right? You call it unbalanced, I call it tackle over, right? Walter Rouse went from his left tackle spot and went and played what is the right tight end spot next to Guyton, and Stogner was in the backside left tackle spot. How are they going to line up to that, Right? I would assume that Oklahoma's got quite a bit out of that, right? And if they give you some angles and some matchups you really like, I think you could see quite a bit of that. But it, it all comes down to how can you pull that nickel, who is a corner body, how can you pull him into the core and make his life miserable in the run game? Yeah. I, Levy's smart enough to figure it out. So I'm I'm interested to see and may, maybe they avoid that somehow, right? But if you're going to play a corner at nickel, I'm going to make you tackle. I'm going to make you take on blocks and tackle. Yeah, yeah. I, I that is interesting. And, and it, first of all, in the run game, find a way to take advantage of it. And the way our receivers blocked, and some of the size that we have out there, if you're undersized at the nickel spot, like that's what makes it so difficult for an offense against our defense to throw some of those bubbles is because we have such great length at the cheetah position, whether it's McCullough or Harrington, uh, it's hard for those DBs to block guys that are six foot three uh, and above. Uh, you flip that around, it's easy for a six foot four Nick Anderson, who I thought blocked his ass off in week one, yeah, to, to block a smaller, shorter, 185 pound guy. So that's something that I think we probably take advantage of too. Yeah, no, I agree. Now, and this is a little in the weeds, but one thing I'll be looking at is how does SMU play the first puller on all the counter stuff, 
right? Especially when they run it to the open side, meaning just to a tackle surface, no tight end over there. Because we saw something interesting in the Arkansas State game. They they just sprinted to the mesh point when they felt down block from the front side tackle. And there are a couple times where Matoyer, Bert, like they didn't touch the defensive end at all. And it really, it really disrupted the timing of the play. Mm-hmm. So is that something SMU sees and goes, huh? It's not a bad idea, right? Because I mean, the tackle variation or the counter variations, like that's that's a bread and butter for this team. Yeah. Along with the what Levy calls tight zone variations. So I'm interested to see how they play that and if they can disrupt the timing of the play like Arkansas State did. Now, if I'm picking one of the ends to run counter at, I'm running it at number nine, Nelson Paul. And it's it's really nothing against him. It's just Elijah Roberts, the other defensive end. Dude, that dude is huge. <laughs> He's yeah. like 280. So I'm running at the 230-pound guy. You know, two, he's like 235. So I think I think we'll see how willing number nine is to take on pullers, right? And he's usually the defensive end into the boundary. So you may see quite a quite a few runs called into the boundary, right? To try to get that matchup. But yeah, let's test, let's test his durability, shall we? Hey, I I got no problem with that. And um we got to have someone that can go test the big guy too, you know? Um, yeah. Oh yeah. I, I don't know how I, I felt good about the tight ends coming out of week one. Um, going to be a little bit different test blocking for those guys. And I, Hey, I, I was happy with what I saw. Hopefully they continue that. Yeah. There are going to be some collisions on the split zone stuff. Good. I like yeah. it. You're, you're going to love it. Now, another thing at can OU's wide receivers win. Going back and watching their defense from a year ago, and I would anticipate them playing some more too high stuff than we saw uh, than we saw them play in their opener against Louisiana Tech. But I think they feel really good about their speed in the back end, right? And I and, and we'll see how the game progresses. But you know, everything OU wants to do, it's. You know, it's all about establishing that run game. And we saw this at the end of last season, remember? How much one, cover one and zero did teams play against Oklahoma oh, because they God. weren't, they didn't feel threatened by the speed at wide receiver. You've got it. The Sooners have to make them pay if they're going to do that stuff. And, and it goes back to, hey, who can run by guys? And SMU's got speed in the back end. Who can run by guys? And then can Dylan Gabriel deliver accurate footballs? when they get the opportunities. Uh, I, well, I, you know, you would think that um, the way they threw it up to Jaden Gibson a couple of times, yeah, it's going to really worry some teams that want to do that. I, I think you, you got to keep taking advantage of that. People are going to go one-on-one with just a go zero or, or just a guy in the middle, just a cover one on you, throw it up go over the top, expose some of those guys with our size. I mean, you, you got to find a way to get them out of it. It'll stay there forever and, and make life hell on you in the running game. Yeah. A couple other things. Running backs got to be good in pass protection. They're going to get tested. Going back and watching last year, lots of internal pressure, lots of different linebacker blitzes. Got to sort it all out. You got to be rock solid, right? Now they'll have some just gap pro stuff to simplify that where the running back will just fit off the edge, right? And you'll, you'll put the responsibility on the offensive line, but those linebackers are coming. That, that was, that was really what they like to do last year from a blitz perspective. So that's something to watch. I think it's going to be a fun matchup to watch between SMU's ends and OU's tackles. Like this is going to be a much bigger test for Rouse and Guyton. Right. And then twist game communication. A lot of three game, three man twist games, right? In obvious passing situations, you you just have to pass it all off. You have to anticipate it. You got to know what's coming. You got to pass it all off, right? And you got to you got to keep the pocket clean. So, I 
I'm excited because I do think that this is this is a much better challenge and it's gonna be a much better gauge of where this offense is at. Yeah, no, I agree. Um both sides of the ball are gonna be a much better challenge than week one. Uh but still still really like how we match up against these guys after looking at it and I I I was I, I thought that okay this could this one could be a little more interesting because of the matchup and but gosh if as long as we are smart with the football we don't penalize ourselves we take advantage of the big play opportunities that I know we're going to have we tackle well I I think we should be able to to, to handle these guys pretty good and look pretty good but it is going to be a nice test I'm looking forward to it I'm with you all right, let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys for the number one thing you'll be watching for in this football game. Uh, this first one comes from at Tom W. Bay, who says, how will the defense respond after giving up a big play? Will they put it behind them or will they let it linger? That's a good point, right? We didn't really see much of that last week, right? Didn't give up a score. And that was something last season, Ted, where – especially late in the year, it felt like once thing, if things went wrong, like they had some trouble putting the train back on the tracks. Yeah, no, I, I that's right. Um, I think you got to watch out for the first couple of drives of the game. That's whenever you're, if you're going to see new stuff, a lot of times they throw it at you. They throw some tempo out there. You know, it, it can be a bit of a scramble drill trying to figure out what we're going to do defensively and how we're going to line up to some of these formations. You'll, you'll see the most like shifts and exotic formations early in the game to really mess with you. And if we can get through that phase and not get frazzled mentally by giving up a couple of big plays and then we're coming to the sideline like, oh, my God, and we just forget everything that we've learned. Um, if we can get through that part of the game, I think we'll be okay. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's the one thing we've seen in it's the, oh my God, here we go again mentality. And everyone starts to maybe do, try to do their job and a little bit of their buddy's job too. And you end up getting exposed for a bunch of explosive plays in a bunch of different areas. So hopefully that doesn't happen. I'm with you. All right. This other one comes from tag Giles at sooner tag. He's looking at the run game. Even though we were successful last week, there wasn't too many longer runs and no QB keepers were very little. Yeah, I think that, and this is something, you know, we had Levy on Coach's Corner on, on Monday and he basically said, hey, like we, the running backs, we got to win some more of those one-on-one -on -one situations. And it'll be interesting to see if they can, especially we'll see if Gavin Sawchuk Right. It sounds like he's going to be cleared to play in this game. And he is a guy that they view really as a guy, the home run threat. Right. So we'll see. But yeah, all of these backs, yeah, you're going to, you got to make some of these free hitters miss for SMU. Right. Now, I, I would love if the offensive line could create a little more space for those guys to operate within. But yeah, the, the run game, you need those explosives. Man, it just it makes life so much easier for you as an offense. And it is it just deflates a defense if you're ripping off chunk runs like that. So I am uh, I'm definitely uh, I'm with him. I'm with our man sooner tag. I I I can't wait to see if they can produce some more explosives in the run game. Yeah. I it really does drive a wedge through like the uh the defense mentally. I, in the past, you give up a big passing play. Okay, well, you know, we got to be better in the rush and coverage has to be tighter. But whenever you're gashing people in the running game, the D-line starts to turn around and get mad at the backers. Like, why aren't you in your gaps? The backers are saying, why are you guys get peeled out up front? And like, everyone starts to point fingers at one another because it's not so clear, like, what exactly is happening. And I <laughs> look at you the mentality of a defense up in a hurry for sure. Yeah. 